name is Lakshmi Sharma. I'm Director of Product Management for uh, Networking at Google Cloud. And um, I have a pleasure of talking to I Ken Solman, he's the chief analyst at 451 Research. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, what hybrid means to customers and what are their pain points, what are their drivers, and what are the tools that are available for making their, their journey to hybrid uh, easy as well as less risky. Over cool. to you. Well, thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, let me kick this off. Ah, technology, we're moving forward. So uh, I wanted to touch on the, the morning's keynotes. Um, hopefully, most of you saw them. Uh, Urs was talking about enterprises need to transform uh, and some of the challenges that they're facing uh, simply because of market pressures, customers' demands, uh, a whole set of different pieces that are really forcing a need to transform. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is really some, some statistics about what's driving some of that. Uh, but also some of the, the capabilities that can help move that forward. Uh, Technology is not standing still, uh, which is an advantage generally, but, but can also be uh, uh, generate a little bit of risk in terms of concerns about what's the right path forward and how to really look at this. Um, if we think about movement to new capabilities and infrastructure, there's tremendous desire. Everybody wants to get to a, a better place. Um, you know, whether or not that happens to be uh, beaches and sunsets, uh, new capabilities in terms of infrastructure, cloud uh, developments, whatever that happens to be. Uh, there's a lot of push to be able to get there. I think we all as humans want to be able to move towards <laughs> a, uh, a better place, whatever that capability is. Uh, exactly how they get there and what they're doing to make those transitions happen, though, uh, are really changing very dramatically in terms of what enterprises are expecting today. And, and I wanted to bring up some data. Uh, 451 has a, a broad study. We have about a 60,000 uh, participant panel uh, that are looking at transitions in technology, uh, budgetary intent, spending. And this is the data that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this happens to be from our Voice of the Enterprise Digital Pulse uh, about transitions in on-prem data. And, and the thing that's the, the desire part of this is if you look at today, um, half of the respondents are identifying that um, between three quarters and all of their infrastructure is on-prem today. Uh, and uh, about another quarter have about half to three quarters. So that's a really large population that are primarily on-prem. And probably that's not a surprise to most of you. Um, hopefully not. Um, the thing I think it's interesting from the desire perspective is you look at where their expectations about where they want to get to in two years. Uh, we're talking about a pretty dramatic change in terms of capabilities, in both in what's on-prem uh, today and what they expect to be able to move out. Uh, again, from an aspirational perspective, you know, there's that desire to be able to get to better infrastructure, to be able to manage your resources better. Mm -hmm. um, it's a key part of what, what some of those uh, shifts are looking at. Uh, but it's a pretty dramatic shift. Mm -hmm. In order to do this, enterprises are really going to need a whole set of capabilities that, mm -hmm. that they may not have today. Uh, and, and that's where, like, you know, infrastructure like what we have, like, at Google, like, in the networking space, uh, we're talking about migrating, like, loads of data, like, in two years, like the number shows. So capability, like, you know, interconnect that we have, uh, the amount of fiber that we have put in, like, any part of the world, so those capabilities may be useful for those customers, right? Like, because you're migrating workloads, migrating data, so you would need that kind of infrastructure support to do that. Well, and as you start to expand into mm -hmm. new areas, it's not only just the migration part, mm -hmm. but it's all those paths to data that you've got to maintain once you're starting to move, once you're in the middle of that transition, mm -hmm. and into whatever next state you wind up getting. Mm -hmm. So interconnection winds up being really critical. Um, it's something that I, I think generally, in, in the move to the early stages of cloud, enterprises really haven't fully understood mm -hmm. precisely how important that is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've all dealt with sort of VPN connections and you know, internet access to be able to manage it. But in order to get um, enterprise capable performance, you have to have interconnection that, that's going to be dependable enough mm -hmm. to be able to manage those transitions. That's interesting. Like, you know, um, I joined Google like six months ago. And it's very interesting to hear when people say, oh, network is seamless. And that's exactly you want customers to see. Like, it's secure. And it's seamless, and it's just it's just connecting you where you want, like you know, bringing network to you, bringing cloud to you. That's what we do in cloud infrastructure, and uh, and all the uh, even with geo expansions and all the expansions that we do in every part of the world, 
uh, we continue to add more fibers. Like, you know, we have uh, 13 uh, subsea cables that we have. We have 125 COP locations. We have uh, loads of uh, dedicated interconnects and, and with SLA. So um, I believe there are no other companies that offer that kind of SLA for interconnect, exactly for the reason that we kind of believe that uh, if its network has to be there, performant, and being able to give you the guarantees that you need in order to migrate your workloads, in order to migrate your data. So, yep. Well, and that seamless piece is what's important, because enterprises traditionally have been used to buying capacity discreetly. I'm going to buy circuits. I'm going to buy links. I'm going to buy ports, you know, mm -hmm. all these pieces. It's being able to, to actually take that, that capability and bring it into an environment that is much easier to use and, and easier to consume that helps reduce risk. But, uh, the other piece that I wanted to, to identify that I thought was interesting about this transition uh, if you look at, at what this transition is going to look like, when you think about how that's going to be consumed, uh, this is a breakdown of expectations of where enterprises are, are, how they're expecting to move workloads and how they're expecting to manage that movement. Uh, the top modernized piece there is really taking a look at expect, expect that, easy for me to say, expecting that they're going to take their existing environments, um, run them on-prem, and then start to be able to bring modern applications. So this is mobile apps that wrap around stuff that's on-prem. Uh, that's that's a, a good first step, but it's also, again, one of these sort of low-risk first-step uh, uh, enterprise strategies. Uh, the second, that, that's a good step down from that, though, but I think is one of the more critical pieces, is refactoring and shift. Um, being able to take key aspects of those business applications, mm -hmm. uh, refactoring what makes sense, basically mm -hmm. pulling out some of those key value functions and being able to take those into the new infrastructure, wherever that winds up mm -hmm. being. Uh, the next beyond that is repurchase and shift. That's just simply, you know, we're going to go take capabilities that somebody else has got and, and we're going we're to run it that way. We're going to manage them simply in that way. Um, lift and shift is one of those pieces that for a long time I think was, was expected to be the primary way enterprise would go forward. We just take the application, we pick it up, we bring it into cloud, co-location, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but enterprises have understood that now that's actually, that's a little more complex than, mm -hmm. than originally it was planned to be. Um, it is an area though that we think about what that transition looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can make a lot of sense for large monolithic functional elements. Hmm. So if we think about things like um, databases, hmm. um, big pieces of that nature, uh, those can be places where that functionality actually makes sense to migrate closer to where you expect it to be. So mm -hmm. sources of data, mm -hmm. uh, management systems for sources of truth, um, that can be a big transition that can be useful there. So uh, that's an interesting one. So let's say for databases, would you, do you hear that those databases will still be managed by uh, the database providers or the IT teams, or where do you see the manageability aspect? It's a transition. So uh, there's a big piece of the, the management, of the operational management, mm -hmm. that I think if enterprises could hand that off to a trusted partner who is managing it, mm -hmm. it would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, they simply want to make sure that all of that functionality moves over, mm -hmm. but they, they don't want to, to carry with all of the management tasks that come mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. That can be a, a real challenge. So there's, there are certain things we are doing, and uh, you know, some of you, if you, uh, if you plan to attend keynotes tomorrow and the networking sessions, so we'll be talking about uh, some of the managed uh, aspects and how do we bring the manageability at the latency and the throughput that we offer through our infrastructure. So please, uh, I would encourage you to attend the uh, keynote session tomorrow uh, where you will hear a lot of things around this. Well, especially when you get to newer technologies, mm -hmm. uh, like transitions into analytics infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, things like building out Hadoop clusters, the management of, of any of these pieces can be a challenge, mm -hmm. and especially when there are already uh, difficulties in making sure that you've got sufficient staff to be able to mm -hmm. manage them. That can help to free up existing staff to be able to leverage the high value capabilities, the use of the analytics, as opposed to having to spend a lot of time adding staff to manage the actual operational pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, enterprises want the functionality. So in the refactor and modernize, uh, we talk a lot about uh, microservices. And a lot of our customers uh, uh, come to us for help with that. You know, uh, m many of you would know our um, efforts in Istio and Kubernetes and the work that we are doing in that space. Uh, we have a lot of sessions coming up around that area, too. So we, we hear a lot of customers my, you know, moving towards microservices. And we do, do take pride in the fact that 
uh, we launch like billions of containers every week in Google Cloud. Like, you know, Kubernetes came out of Borg, and uh, that's how we run our infrastructure. So how do you, what kind of applications do you see when you think about modernizations? Uh, and do you, from a refactoring perspective, do you see uh, customers first refactoring and trying them on-prem and then moving to managed, let's say, cloud? Or do you expect to see a management across hybrid cloud? Well, there's got to be, from an operational perspective, you've got to have some level of unified management mm -hmm. across that entire environment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the ideal, you know, that sandy beach that people are trying to get to uh, is uh, an equivalent capability across all of the different execution venues that mm -hmm. you've got. Um, and to be able to manage that with the same set of tools across that environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a lot of enterprises, they expect that to be uh, a, a, a nirvana they just can't get to uh, because they've been used to treating the cloud infrastructure differently than the way in which they run what they've got on-prem. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, that can present some real challenges in terms of your, your mobility and workload mobility. It's really hard to be able to do that shift effectively if you've got different management capabilities. And you've got to run and operate differently in terms mm -hmm. of where those capabilities are. Very good. Okay. Uh, in terms of the applications, uh, where we see a, a lot of those directions really is across the map. Um, mm -hmm. There's some vertical variation that we see by industry, mm -hmm. uh, but the expectation to get towards uh, a re-architected environment that can better take advantage um, is a very strong piece of that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that, that's some variability in terms of where that all gets directed. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to keep this interactive, and I wanted a quick show of hands. In terms of the, the lift and shift capabilities, uh, for the folks who are here from the enterprise side of things, is how many of you are expecting to be able to fully refactor any of your key business apps? Quick show of hands. A handful here and there. Again, probably, uh, where are we? Uh, uh, about a 18%, maybe a little less. Uh, how many of you are expecting to be able to build net new uh, in new infrastructure? Oh. Yeah. So I, it's one of the things that I tend to see maybe a little stronger. You're here at Next. Um, you're probably a little more cloud aware in terms of what your directions are and where you're headed. So. Uh, another data point that I thought was particularly interesting in all of this. Uh, is, is the shift to what those infrastructures are actually going to look like. And we start thinking about what the transitions, uh, you know, yes, people are getting off-prem, but where are they actually heading and what are those expectations? Today, again, most of the infrastructure that enterprise is working with is, is on-prem, no big surprise there. Um, there is a reasonable amount of on-prem private cloud capability today. Um, a bit of hosted private cloud, not a lot in terms of sort of what the, the, the general breakdown is. Um, a fair amount of use of SaaS and uh, co-location. Again, co-location, in a lot of cases, we've got folks who are looking to move uh, systems into environments where they've got better connectivity, maybe transitioning out of existing data center environments, uh, a couple big steps there. Um, and of course, a reasonable amount of public cloud use. But again, if we look at what that total enterprise picture is, traditional uh, full-blown public cloud for uh, line of business operations, real serious production applications, still relatively low. Uh, you know, sub 10% number is something that uh, we see pretty broadly. Uh, my guess is here at Next, there's probably a little more use of, of direct public cloud capability in whatever that capacity is. But, uh, the thing though that I think is, is more important is what the transition looks like. Mm -hmm. and, and to be able to move towards a doubling of utilization of public cloud capabilities, again, is going to require a significant amount of transition for enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the places, to your question, uh, about management and, and or the orchestration pieces mm -hmm. of this. Uh, that's where there's going to need to be a, a very large step in terms of how enterprise is really working mm -hmm. with those capabilities. This is very interesting. Like, so although it says that on-prem ID infrastructure is going to be uh, half of what it is today, but it's, it's distributed across. So it seems like, uh, based on the current results, enterprises will still contain the hierarchies and the orgs and the roles and the policies, and then they will be distributing it across. So something around policy management, like centralized policy management, keeping, how, how's, it, how's the security, like, uh, won't the control for security going to be more distributed? Absolutely. Um, well, I think that's the challenge, is that I think for a lot of organizations, 
once they start to be able to, to spread into new environments, it's great to have the ability to have you know, scaling capacity, mm -hmm. you know, whatever those drivers are, to be able to get them to those points. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is to be able to take all of the people and processes that have been running the organization you know, for however long mm -hmm. um, and actually transition them into mm -hmm. an environment in which they can take advantage of hybrid capability. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a set of different aspects that are, that are going to start to come into play. We already see it today with mm -hmm. concerns about data sovereignty. Mm -hmm. you know, what do I put where? Um, where's the data that's going to be actually that this app is consuming, going to be delivered from? What do I need to do with the results? You know, where can I run analytics? How do I balance all that stuff? That presents a, a whole set of new challenges that for most enterprises, um, they haven't had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, here I will kind of bring in uh, some of the tools that we are offering, and there are two talks around this today. Uh, so we had been hearing similar things that, hey, we have these identity management systems, and we use these identity-aware proxies and uh, on-prem, and then we go to the cloud, then we are using managed services from, let's say, from Google, like, you know, so uh, we are using your GCS uh, managed services, and so we, we are coming from public side, we are coming from on-prem through private services. How do we how do we manage all those access, right? How do we integrate them into a common, uh, say, policy framework so that we continue to use the GCP resources, like, say, which are in VPCs, and we, we can have a mapping of the identities, whether it is device identity or IP range, and we can still protect the data exfiltration, which, is, which may happen because of you know, existing roles which were able to access, let's say, GCS buckets. So we, we put in all of that together in, a, in, a, you know, in something called VPC service control. So you can, you can bring your identity aware proxies. You can put your policies right at the VPC level. We have like, you know, host based firewalls and things like that. So you, you combine both of them, and then you can bring in all the context, like, you know, oh, where, who you are, where you're coming from, what time of the day you're coming from. So with, with this distributed kind of access of the resources, things like tools like that and automation like that becomes very important, right? So, so the, those are the things we had been hearing too, so it's kind of maps to what you just described. Well, it helps to, to manage what is that growing complexity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is when you make that shift, um, you're now in multiple environments and, and just by nature it's gonna be mm -hmm. more complex. Mm -hmm. What that demands is that you have tools to be able to leverage that. I got a ghost that keeps shifting these forward here. I guess, or either that or somebody really wants to jump ahead. Uh, and and the, uh, the enterprise challenge is figuring out how do you actually live in that world in which you now have got um, a whole set of more distributed environments mm -hmm. with diverse characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage it in the same way? Mm -hmm. uh, because some of those big challenges are, are being able to take the staff you've got. You know, in transitions like this, you know, I don't think enterprises out there are expecting that they're going to radically increase the amount of staff they've got to manage it. So they've got to have simplifications that can help to not only make the orchestration and management piece a lot simpler, um, but to reduce some of that risk in that transition. Um, the point that you're making about security is right at the top of those lists mm -hmm. in terms of how you manage and control. Being able to integrate identity mm -hmm. is something that most organizations have had a hard time with mm -hmm. to date, mm -hmm. and that's one of the more powerful tools and capabilities um, to have at, at your disposal. To be able to transform what was, you know, a lot of those functional perimeter-based capabilities that on-prem were okay and manageable, but that once you start to get out into a more distributed environment, can really create complexities that are, that are hard to get your hands around from a, an operational perspective. You brought up the product name and the terms, like we do call it service parameter, where we kind of put in all the VPC resources and we connect. So yeah, uh, and uh, on the people side too, I was in uh, India, like uh, there was a cloud summit in India like a few weeks ago, and the points that you touch upon about like, will each organization go and hire these people? Like, it's not just about data scientists, it's about like, just the whole manageability, automation, orchestration, and understanding different clouds. Yeah, so we hear from like, you know, financials and retail and across the board uh, in this region as well as in Asia region, uh, that yes, uh, it's so difficult to hire those people and then kind of train them on enterprise practices while you're training, while they're already bringing kind of engineering. So, but we do need to kind of bring in blend of how our organization are structured and, uh, you know, and how those policies in the organizational environment are done so, you know, the tools like being able to kind of apply, you know, the educa education that comes from understanding IT infrastructure, bringing to the cloud, and applying that back through our tools like 
uh, hierarchical policy like our folder projects. So, so we have been doing that mix, and we have been hearing from customers it's not easy to just go and hire those people who can just do same thing across all the uh, IT organizations. So it kind of ties in to the point that you said. Yes, it's not easy to just do each of them for each IT organization. That's why we are trying to build uh, that experience of understanding enterprise organizations while we are bringing in technology innovation. Well, it says transitions are a, a huge help. Um, staffing has always been a particular problem, but especially as you start going to new levels of complexity, um, that can really pre present some additional challenges. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, to touch on are some of the drivers. Uh, what's actually motivating people to be able to make these shifts? Uh, an interesting point in some of this data, uh, it used to be you know, the, the original idea about cloud is people are going to go to cloud because it was cheap. You know, cloud is going to be the, the path to reduce cost, and this is going to be wonderful. Well, you know, what we've seen over the course of the last, you know, this is a particular study that's been running now for a little over five years for us, uh, is that reality is starting to, to finally uh, appear, and people are understanding that while cost may be a component, um, cost really shouldn't be the primary driver. And if you look now, this is one of the first times in, in this study um, that we're actually starting to get pretty close to parity with some of the more important and valuable drivers. Cost management can be a huge benefit, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's one of those things that if you're just trying to target that alone, you miss out on so many other benefits of mm -hmm. what that transition can look like. Uh, and, and those next three that are down there that are close, grouped fairly closely, uh, enhancing agility, um, improving access to new technology, uh, modernizing the IT infrastructure are all some of those principal drivers that we see about uh, the, the directions of new infrastructure mm -hmm. management. Uh, let's get back there. <laughs> the, the shark will appear, but just not yet, not just yet. Uh, one of the big challenges uh, it, in terms of helping organizations move this forward, one of the things that we wind up doing from an analyst perspective, um, is really helping them align what they're trying to move towards mm -hmm. um, and what those capabilities are. Um, agility, of course, is, is a big one. Being able to move to scale rapidly, mm -hmm. um, being able to manage some of those uh, shifts in terms of managing infrastructure with demand, being able to be you know, a little more flexible in terms of, of where your resources are, mm -hmm. how your infrastructure actually gets built, and, and what it actually costs you mm -hmm. um, can be one of the biggest uh, benefits in terms of moving to hybrid environments that, that let you pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of this, if we could do, like, you know, yes, uh, reduce IT costs seems to be a little lower, but we still hear customers that do, they do want to understand what the TCO looks like, right? Uh, reducing cost is one thing, but the overall operational cost, right? So if you're going from VM to containers, uh, do I have to use different tools? Do I have to retrain my organization? So you talked about this construct called VPC. Do I have to have a different paradigm just to go to containers, right? If you go from K8 on-prem to GKE or you know Google's Kubernetes engine, do I have to understand different things about load balancing? Do I have to Will the VM load balancing be different? So, so we do hear all of that because, like you said, those three things about modernizing IT infrastructure, like how you're modernizing the infrastructure all the way from what, you know, whether it will be bare metal or VM or container, and then how you will be improving access, which goes back to the, you know, I'm used to ac accessing resources through private IP. Are you going to tell me that my IP address management would be different, right? And will it be different in different regions? Do I have to connect different? So, so we hear all of that, and that becomes TCO for us. Uh, does that kind of make sense, so like operationalization and all of it? Absolutely. I mean, again, getting back to people and process. Mm -hmm. um, so much of what the transition is to uh, new models, whether or not they happen to be hybrid or, or simply revamping the capabilities that you have already, uh, are being able to ensure that you can actually bring the rest of the organization along with you when you mm -hmm. get there. Some of that starts with development process, um, but a big part of it has to be the operational environment that's going to support it. Um, you know, if your dev teams are, are getting way out ahead in terms of what their requirements are, but you can't provide that from an mm -hmm. operational perspective, that's just as much of a problem as you know if you can't build and ship product. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a challenge. And, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, from a dev perspective, I wanted to get another quick poll. Uh, how many of you would identify that your organizations uh, are doing uh, a DevOps, you know, CI, CD kind of development process today? Is that a hand? All right, maybe, maybe half-ish, not quite. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things for our numbers in terms of uh, what we see broad enterprise um, is that it's still relatively low. Um, so again, 
you're all here at Next, so you're probably a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, but it, it's an area that you know, actually getting the environment to support that transition of, of dev teams um, can be just as much of a, a challenge in terms of where this all winds up mm -hmm. moving forward and, and how it can be managed. Um, to your point, you've got to be able to bring the rest of the organization along when you get to that journey. It's um, a little bit more challenging in terms of where that fits. Now, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, time for the shark. Uh, as well as desire, there's also a lot of fear. And, and we talked a little bit about sort of what those concerns are. But quite reasonably, when we think about uh, especially network infrastructure, there's a lot of concern about what new models can provide uh, and, and what the transition risks are of being able to move to those environments. Uh, but a lot like sharks, you know, this happens to be a Caribbean reef shark that is really good for the reef ecosystem. Um, they don't really bother people all that much. Uh, but they look pretty scary. They're still a shark. And, and they're a, a reasonably good metaphor for what a lot of these transitions are because you know, I think a, a lot of organizations look at what that transition is and all they see is change. And, and change, is, change when it's not well defined, when you don't understand what's going to get you to that new environment, um, can be pretty scary for good reason because you don't know what that outcome is going to look like. Uh, and there are more than enough cautionary tales that are out there. You know, people have seen things go wrong when whatever happened. Uh, I, I'd make the point that a lot of this might be tied to not being fully aware of enough of the network and interconnect pieces that you got to have to be able to bring that together. But yes. we'll leave it up to all of, all of you uh, broadly. I would say that it is because people don't really understand. I mean, they understand the current way of designs. They understand what have been told to them, like you know, going from boxes on prem to boxes in cloud like you know so hey instead of like i will create your firewall but i will keep it like a box right i will it will be still throttled because of bandwidth the load balancer would still be throttled by the bandwidth i think that's also because they continue to be scared because of those reasons but if they were told that the shark is low you know maybe like <laughs> a gigantic shark and then they don't, that it can't even move, it will just stay globally and would not really touch you, it will help you. Like what we have, with, uh, you know, we, we do here all the time because we are so simple. Uh, like if people would have really done the distributed like kind of SDN fabric that, the way we have, like what we call Andromeda and uh, edge automation, it's like truly software defined. I know I'm kind of, I'm not looking at the shark because I'm not afraid of it because nobody, when I came to Google Cloud, like it's just, we, we just have very simple things the way they're supposed to be. And that's why people wouldn't be scared. But we want to be able to explain that how simple it is. And it should, this is how it should have been. Just because you have global infrastructure, just because you have you know, pops everywhere and fiber everywhere, uh, that, that doesn't cause a risk. And that doesn't cause complexities. Because the software which is on top, it's simple. It's really you know, logically coordinated control plane which is built to kind of scale to the infrastructure that we have. So people, it, it's just, it's so simple to understand. And then it, that's how SDN was supposed to be, right? Like you have a logically coordinated control plane, you'll put services on top. So if some services are also built the way that application developers are used to, that's how this company builds the infrastructure. Whether it is at edge, whether you talk about like data center, whether you talk about like your cloud fabric, it's, it runs at the scale. So, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and, um, and they were asking about the same thing. Oh, you are so global. Is it your infrastructure? So people forget that infrastructure is not just hardware and edges and routers. The infrastructure is the capability comes from the software that we talk about. That's what made cloud possible. And if we would have made that smaller in scale, then, we, then there would be complexity. We have taken all those complexities out. You just, you just deploy, click of a button, you, let's say you have global load balancer. You just go to one place and configure. Then you go to, you know, if you want to bring in your capabilities like Cloud Armor, you just go and configure another click of a button, whether it is containers, whether it is VM. It's really like single point of configuration management and distributed to the, you know, scale of the world. And if, if people would just visualize that, I think they would not be afraid of it. Well, I, I think one of the challenges is that you know we're all humans. We see that doing the same things that we've been doing is the least risky way to, to go forward. Uh, and, and I think especially when we start thinking about you know, our application structures and interconnection, uh, that there's an expectation that 
you know, if we just simply take what we had on-prem, put it into new environments um, in exactly the same way, it, it's just, you know, it, it, that's the safest way to do it. You know, it's kind of like walking on the beach in dress shoes. You, you can do that, um, but you're gonna get sand in your shoes, and it's really not the, the best way to go about it. You know, put on flip-flops, you know, get comfortable. Uh, but for, for enterprises, um, that first sort of it's that lift and shift piece of we're gonna take exactly what we've got, we're gonna reproduce it um, you know, exactly the same way it was because we know that works without thinking about a lot of the simplifications that can actually start mm -hmm. to pull out um, some of the complexity. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the, the way in which applications have been built and a lot of those structures uh, work really well for the technologies that were there, but those simplifications that now start to allow uh, a, a much easier management, mm -hmm. um, better security, better interconnection more than anything else um, in new environments can actually start to help that transition and can reduce risk in that process mm -hmm. as well. Um, that's I think one of the things that many enterprises tend to get stuck on uh, is that there's an expectation that we simply have to reproduce it exactly the way we, we did on prem. Mm -hmm. you know, I've got a whole bunch of VLANs, I need to map those same VLAN connections to exactly what I've got you know, wherever I happen to be. Uh, despite the complexity of being able to manage all that, those tie-ins and the configuration complexity that comes with it. It's important to realize that, that maintaining complexity is also a risk factor. And I, I know in a lot of the conversations we have with our clients, um, that, that, that expectation that we just keep things the way they are misses out on an opportunity to actually improve uh, ri their risk posture, improve their security, um, reduce errors in configuration. You know, everybody's got good statistics on, on how many outages are caused simply by you know, manual error and, and some of those transitions. Um, it, it can be a real challenge in terms of, of what really needs to happen. I've used this uh, analogy before in, um, you know, when I worked in previous job that um, some you know, cloud providers who started uh, with the, keeping the same notion as in terms of manageability and operations at IT, when they moved it to cloud, they really took the mainframe. So clouds are the, not for us, cloud providers are the new mainframes of the world, right? So now once you're stuck, you don't even know <laughs> where your storage is and how, where my policies are managed, what kind of visibility do I have? Do I, can I just use my manageability and visibility tools that I have? Like where is my packet, you know, packets going, flow going? Like, so all that visibility and manageability around like my information, let's say in this case VPC or in this case your resources, is, it won't, is not easy to offer because like it's, it's just a new mainframe for some providers, not for us. Well, and you bring up the point about operational visibility, which is another critical part. Um, you know, the move to virtualization uh, gave organizations a lot more visibility in terms of what was actually happening in the infrastructure. The move to cloud actually increases that dramatically further. Uh, but most organizations don't take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, because they're not actually set up to be able to leverage greater uh, visibility, to be able to take all that telemetry and actually digest it, um, which actually brings me to the next point I wanted to identify, uh, which is that there's a dramatic lack of automation. Um, if we think about what organizations are doing today, um, we've got to get more automated in ways that are, are more sophisticated. Um, having lots of additional telemetry that can give you information about what's happening is great, mm -hmm. um, but in many cases, we, we keep running with the same procedures um, that have got strong manual dependencies, and, and this is particularly true in networking. Uh, and it's one of those things that I, I think is, a, uh, you know, for me, one of those big transitional opportunities that, that you can actually start to do a lot more in terms of both the capabilities you have, the awareness you have in terms of the amount of telemetry that's coming out of those environments, mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which you can put it to work to, again, simplify what you're doing day in and day out. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting piece. So we used to hear, and like even before I joined this company, other places, hey, cloud can only offer you L3 visibility, or it can give you like, you know, maybe end of the day information about all your applications. So uh, to be able to get like, say, you know, traditional net flow IP fix like of information, as well as you can give like a, L3 information, so a combination of that was kind of uh, what, what enterprises had been asking for or like customers had been asking for. So in that space, we have made uh, you know, some um, products like which we call VPC flow logs, which gives you a combination of both. 
So, and it can continue to integrate with your existing CM infrastructure. So if you're used to using certain tools for just uh, digesting that information and doing troubleshooting, so we have received a lot of good feedback because we have been able to understand that, yes, you do want, like, you know, as I said, like NetFlow-like information of your IP flows, but at the same time, you do want, like, where is, my, where is it coming from? Where, what my IP address is, like the L3 plus uh, application-like information. So, so we do have some, we heard that feedback, and we are bringing up, we have brought up some products like that in that space. Well, because it's critical to mm -hmm. being able to effectively manage your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of organizations tend to sort of layer on uh, a lot of that monitoring management capability, uh, again, especially from networking side, um, and being able to have the, your, the environment actually provided for you, again, simplifies what you can do with it and how you can manage it. Uh, uh, curious in terms of, of the environment that's here, how many of you are using uh, more um, NetFlow, man well, things like uh, network management capabilities like NetFlow and other telemetry to be able to give you um, real-time information about how your environments are, are operating. You know, a lot of organizations we work with, a handful. Okay, so we're, we're getting there in good shape. Um, a lot of the capabilities that uh, next stage environments provide can really help you get to greater levels of visibility um, and also greater levels of integration. We talked about identity tie-ins, some of those pieces. When you start looking at automation, that becomes an even bigger piece of that environment and where that fits. I also want to make sure that uh, if there are any questions that we're going over any of this, um, we're also happy to take questions as well. So anything that we've raised or anything that doesn't fit today? Right. All right, well, and I want to push on to one of the other pieces about network automation and what is it that holds people back? Uh, network automation is, is by its nature harder than compute. Um, and, and this is a <laughs> back up here. Uh, and, and uh, that's due to the fact that the impact and the effect uh, of network automation <laughs> is very different than compute. It must be the shark pressing the button, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that if you think about compute, we got really good at doing compute automation because compute's relatively isolated. The challenge is doing it at scale. You've gotta be able to do lots of whatever that automation piece is. Uh, but you're actually only working on small, reasonably atomic pieces of, of infrastructure when you actually manage it. Network turns that whole thing on its head. Networking uh, automation is much more complicated and I think gets viewed as more risky because of the fact that you know, network configuration changes, <laughs> much like managing slides, uh, has a much broader effect. Uh, you've got, you make a network configuration change and there are a whole set of potentially connected devices that are tied to it. Uh, it means that there's a lot more perceived risk around network automation. The real paradox, to my mind, is that here you've got an environment in which there is risk, but yet there's still really low automation. And automation would get you to the point at which you actually can reduce risk because you're doing fewer manual operations. So it, it's one of these crazy situations when you think about how you manage it. But there's a significant opportunity when you move towards new environments mm -hmm. to be able to leverage native capabilities to actually you know, uh, automate away much of that manual mm -hmm. process, much of those capabilities. I think complexity in some cases like, um, come from, yes, network is global. It's, it's there. It's seamless. And I, I'll go back to the example from the shark. Like, hey, this is the, here is the DNS. Here is the CDN provider. Here is your API. Here is your API gateway. And it will, everybody just talks, starts from, because it is hybrid, because it is multi-cloud, let's just do federation here, federation here, federation here. This will have different configuration. I, I feel like that's also, and I will go back to my kind of example of, if, if we think about services as application running on top of an SDN fabric, that's how you know, SDN or cloud automation was supposed to be. So you're just kind of adding services as and when you deploy, and you can take those services in a managed fashion as well, right? You know, some of the things around Istio, for example, they were meant to kind of abstract the service plane, which sits on top of networking plane. But if you do not simplify your network control plane, you won't be able to kind of get the scalability out of your application. So they both need to continue to go hand in hand. And the reason, other reasons, based on my experience of working with telcos and enterprises has been, there's so many contracts to write. If you talk about I'm going from so one region or one country to another country, you're talking about inter-AS, you're talking about writing three months, four months, spending time on 
legal contracts of how, not just about data, just about policies, right? So if, if we could just take that away, which, which we do through our global VPCs, and you don't have to really worry about you know, all of that contracting and peering and all of that because somebody has taken care of you for that for you, and you just worry about adding your application and discovering your application wherever you are, I, you know, some of the complexity through the automation that you talked about does go away. Well, and, and I think that's one of the challenges to automation is that when we have a really complex environment, the automation task winds up being that much more challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, what you have to build around it is more complicated to build. Uh, if you've got the ability to simplify it, and Istio is a great example, uh, it, now you've got the ability to leverage what are built-in capabilities that, that simply remove that complexity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How many of the crowd here are actually using Istio today? And it's now officially gone 1.0, but it's been out there for a while. And in terms of we've got a handful of folks who are, are playing with Istio already. I mean, the whole idea about service meshes uh, is one of, again, these next steps uh, simplifications that can help move you to environments that are gonna be better suited to hybrid infrastructures that'll help to abstract away a lot of the complexity um, that you get when you're moving towards environments that give you a lot of choice and a lot of flexibility in terms of where you're headed. Mm -hmm. so. so making transitions, it's not really the network, it's because network is just there. So the transition that happens, if through that transition journey, if you can keep the paradigm same maybe, like in the reduce the toil with the automation and the tools, and just allow your customers or your enterprises to not just develop faster, but continue to update faster too. I, I hear a lot of numbers about, hey, we have, you can write like 2,000 deployments in a day, but it worked if you have to, if we, I, I want to bring in like a lot of features every day, I want to make sure that my automation and, and orchestration continue to support that development, upgrades needs to be faster too, right? Absolutely. Well, it, to get to that level of speed, mm -hmm. you've got to simplify what your operational ca capabilities mm -hmm. are. You mm -hmm. can't have complicated systems that are running it. So again, a great way to be able to manage that and, and work that transition. Uh, one of the other points I wanted to bring up, and this is actually the, the last slide in terms of what some of the, the data is that I've got up here. And this is one of the ones that I think concerns me most about this most recent study. Um, this is something that came out of the field just a couple months ago. Um, which is the budget that's typically being allocated. Uh, if we take a look at what's happening uh, in terms of expectation of spending, I think right now a lot of the fear about what transitions and risk are, are presenting to people um, are actually holding back expectations of spending. Um, this is something that from a, a, the value to organizations uh, is something that you've got to be willing to be able to budget um, to be able to make this transition because there are going to be shifts in terms of where that fits. Uh, if we think about you know, what the expectation is in terms of spending on transformation and investment in uh, the infrastructure and how that actually gets transitioned, uh, these are things that you know, you've got uh, a relatively small number that are looking at spending significantly enough to be able to get to the infrastructure support that's gonna need them, that they're going to need to be able to get there. Um, and I think a lot of this winds up being driven by concerns that I don't want to invest in something that I see as risky uh, and, and it's good, but the challenge there is then that that holds off um, what actually are the capabilities that are gonna enable you to get to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that presents some difficulties. Um, this is something where you don't have to go all in in terms of transformation, but you do need to make the effort to be able to, to get to a point at which you can operate more efficiently um, and you can leverage a lot of these capabilities. So it's not just, so this specific slide is about like how much budget on the transformation side, but the budget could still be spent on the operational side. So we still have kind of, you can still go and help out by operationalizing, keeping like, you know, extending in a seamless way and giving all the tools, so, but that budget still exists. Okay. Not getting rid of anything. But to get there, I think the, the, the thing that I think both Lakshmi and I have been, have been really trying to, to reinforce is that uh, the fundamental aspect of this is that you've got to get to a point at which you can be more efficient. Um, being able to move towards new environments um, is powerful. Um, there are a tremendous set of things that it helps to bring to the way in which the organization uh, can potentially operate, uh, but it's something where you've got to be able to, to ensure that the people and processes um, are supported with capabilities underneath this as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. So simplify operations like we, you know, with tools like uh, so Kubernetes engine that we support and automation, automation end to end. So all the work that is happening in uh, Istio and managing services across. Uh, so that as well as like the combination that I talked about, like VPC service control, where you integrate all the way from edge to the core through identity, all the way to your VPC resources and manage services and managing all those abstractions around it. So seems like, you know, so we have in networking, we have a lot of good tools and then there are a lot of talks uh, where please, uh, you know, go today, there are sessions around end-to-end um, -end security uh, from edge to data center, uh, edge to core and how do we connect that through the identity aware proxies and then uh, we talk about uh, logical association and applica application grouping like we have a lot of uh, products around application delivery like you know the load balancer global load balancer um, and uh, cloud armor so a lot of things around the application uh, grouping as well as the security aspects rather mm -hmm. and uh, it's really managed through the similar abstractions and i would rather say that infrastructure that is built over years so one is, one is from how do you access that, but at the same time, for us, our infrastructure is designed that way too. So if you talk about like things coming from egress, they hit our you know, GFE, and which is kind of, which supports our global load balancer, which supports like, you know, products like Cloud Armor. So we are organized, or infrastructure-wise also, we are designed that way, and we do have software that puts abstractions on top. And we do continue to kind of make investment through the open source work. And, uh, yeah, open source supports hybrid and multi-cloud too. Right? Well, and that can smooth that path for, mm -hmm. for enterprises to be able to, to make that transition mm -hmm. um, and to be able to get to that point. Um, it's important to think about not only the automation pieces, but how that actually affects operation as a whole. And, mm -hmm. and to your point, it's simplifying all those operations, being able to go bring that together with a set of tools that mm -hmm. enterprises can typically consume and the ability to be able to bring that um, all in ways that, that leverage hybrid infrastructure mm -hmm. can help to make that transition uh, mm -hmm. as, as painless as possible. Um, but more importantly, to reduce risk in that transition at the same time. Mm -hmm. And hybrid does mean that multi-cloud as well, right? So we can help customers go from one cloud to another. As like, analysts, you know? we've got very specific <laughs> definitions for some things, but <laughs> the reality is hybrid environments are simply uh, a matter of you know, multiple clouds, multiple capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but the important thing is to understand how you're going to uh, how you're going to run that environment and operationalize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the points that you're identifying are, are big pieces of making that transition simple from an enterprise perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think you were mentioning that this afternoon uh, there's also going to be uh, a little bit of a, a yes. some more surprises right. in the networking track later on today. That's correct. So uh, there's a session uh, this, uh, this afternoon coming up on um, how, how, there is, um, how we are defining some constructs and networking where you would be able to leverage them and get like native load balancing in a hybrid way. And when I say hybrid, to me, hybrid is like the point that I touched upon. It's multi-cloud and hybrid across infrastructure, like load doing load balancing uh, with highest latency and the best bandwidth optimization for VMs as well as for containers. So, so there are some uh, where, you know, things we are going to launch and we are going to talk about to make this very simple, operationally same, uh, regardless of what infrastructure and what location do you choose. And bringing all the power of like what we talked about, like CDN and you know TLS support from multiple certificates and things that we have been doing in the space of global load balancing, and we will bring all of that to support multi-cloud and hybrid. Uh, so if if you you know plan to attend or want to hear about that, uh, please refer to some of our uh, Kubernetes uh, sessions, and there will be and as well as like end-to-end -end security sessions. So with that, uh, thank you so much, and thank you everybody uh, for attending. If you have some questions, uh, you know, uh, we'll be around for a few minutes here. Uh, so with that, thank you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah.